So 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we're going to start reading verse 15. For all things are for your sake. All things are for your sake. 2 Corinthians 4, 15. That the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God. Then it said, which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. Outward man, inward man. For our light afflictions, which is but for a moment, worketh for us, a far more than exceeding an eternal way to glory. Why we look not at the things which are seen, that's the outward man, but at the things which are not seen, that's the inward man. The things which are seen are temporary, the outward man, and the things that the outward man deal with are temporary. But the things which are not seen are eternal. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you now for giving us eternal life through your Son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for giving us eternal things in the new covenant. And we thank you that old things are passed away. Now we bless you, we praise you, we appreciate you. Now I'm at what my prayer is, Father, that you would give wisdom and knowledge and understanding to the listeners. First of all, when you get saved, that's what God's going to give you, wisdom. Wisdom is a principal thing, therefore get wisdom, but in all you're getting, get understanding. So if you're born again, you have the spirit of wisdom. But I'm here to give you the knowledge of God's word. And then the Holy Spirit will give you the understanding of God's word. Reject the knowledge, you cannot get the understanding. Now, let me go and show you that. Hosea chapter 4. Let's go back and look at Old Testament scripture called Hosea. If you go to the book of Daniel and go forward, you'll run right into Hosea. But we're going to look at Hosea chapter 4. And we're going to show you Israel. Why Israel did not know who Christ was. Why did they not understand? When Jesus came to them, why did they not know him? Why did they not understand? Here's their reason right here. Hosea chapter number 4 and verse number 6 told us why. Amen. Said my people. Now, at that time, we know that was Israel. My people are destroyed. That's verse number six. Now, we know that word destroyed means cut off. My people are cut off for one reason. Here it is, for lack of knowledge. Now, that's an awesome thing for them to die, but cut off because they didn't have knowledge. They didn't have anybody who knew the word. They didn't have anybody who can get the word from God. See, they had a lot of prophets. But they had an Isaiah and they had a Jeremiah. But now Hosea would tell you the problem with Israel now is they, they don't have anybody to give them the word. And then when God raised up somebody to give them the word, they wouldn't receive it. So my people destroyed for lack of knowledge. But let's see, God did have somebody to tell them. Because the next verse said, because thou hast rejected knowledge. See, God now raised up prophets for them. And what did they do? They rejected knowledge. That's what I'm giving you. I would also reject you, God says. Thou shalt no, be no priest to me. Seeing thou hast forgotten the Lord thy God, I would also forget thy children. And then it says, as they were increased, so they sinned against me. How did they do that? They rejected God's word, rejected his prophets. Therefore, I would change their glory and the shame. So their problem, look at Isaiah 5, 13. You and Hosea, go back to Isaiah chapter 5 and verse 13. So their whole problem was they rejected God's prophets. God would send them prophets, tell the prophets to tell them, but they wouldn't believe it. They wouldn't receive it. And that's how God does today, Isaiah chapter 5 and verse number 13. Okay, it's on the screen. There we go. Therefore, my people are gone into captivity. 
First, I showed you my people destroyed. They're cut off. Now I'm showing you that gold in the captivity because they have no knowledge. One reason. They're gone into captivity because they have no knowledge. And their honorable men are famished, and their mother too dried up for thirst. Therefore hell has enlarged herself and opened her mouth without measure. And their glory and their multitude and their pump and he that rejoices shall descend into it. Again, therefore my people are gone into captivity for one reason, because they have no knowledge. I just read you that same thing in Hosea. Chapter 4 and verse 6. All right, now, I'm going to give you the knowledge of God's Word. See, you can't just go and say, well, the Lord said. I mean, where's your knowledge coming from? So you got to understand, this is why he gave you the New Testament. Look in the New Testament and see, can you find that? And then you have the knowledge of God's Word. But you need a teacher. You need somebody to teach you the knowledge of God's Word. Uh, now that's Jeremiah. Look at Jeremiah chapter 3. Every time I read Jeremiah chapter 3, I think of one person that go to this ministry, my sister minister, Eva Brown, one of the people that came to our ministry 30 five years ago. In Jeremiah 3, this is the scripture she said that the Lord showed her. Jeremiah chapter 3, and she said, this is why I came to this church, Pastor. In Jeremiah 3 and verse 15, I will give you pastors according to my heart, which shall feed you with, there it is, knowledge and understanding. Well, the Holy Ghost is going to give you understanding, but I have to feed you with the knowledge of God's Word. And then the Holy Ghost will give you the understanding. So that's what you have to understand. And so that's what happened to these people. You know, when God would give them, give them prophets, they had to understand that they, their responsibility was to receive them because their responsibility was to give them the knowledge from God. Every situation you would know what to do if you receive the knowledge of God's Word. Now, if you're not a man of God, if you're not a woman of God, you don't, God don't give you the knowledge of His Word. All right, that's why I say it. There was a time in my life where I just preached sermons. I didn't know any about it. But my responsibility is to teach you God's Word. All right, now let's go into this because I want to show you, uh, let's go show you the two men. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I'm going to take you through. I know my wife did a lot this morning, and I thank God for her. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, I'm going to show you uh, the two men, and I'm going to show you why I said the new is better than the old. In 1 Corinthians chapter number 15, the apostle Paul, this is how he taught us. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and verse number 44. He's teaching you Christ, and that's what I want to do. Let's start at verse 42, back at the 42. I'm just going to take my time here, and I'm going to teach you Christ, but I want to show you how he taught Christ. Remember, Jesus is called Son of Man. All right, I'm going to walk over to the cross. Jesus is called Son of Man. When he died on this cross, he died as the son of man. Now that word man means Adam. He died as the son of man, son of Adam. Now, you must see today two men. There's an outward man on the cross. His name is Jesus. But then there's an inward man in Jesus called Christ. Everybody follow me so far. That man on the inside also have to die. Jesus going to die to death. He's going to die a natural death, and he's going to die a spiritual death. Now that's very important 
Because when Adam ate of the tree of not the good and evil, the Bible said, the day you eat thereof, you shall surely die. So he died that day spiritually. So spiritual death, if you're taking notes, means separation from God. Let me say it again. Spiritual death means separation from God. And everyone out there that's listening to me, if you don't have Christ in you, you don't have eternal life. Your soul is spiritually dead. It means it's cut off from God. Your soul is cut off from God. Cut off from eternal life. Once you get eternal life, now your soul is connected to God and the life of God flows through your soul that keeps your soul alive. Now, Christ already died to pay the price so your soul can live forever with him. But you have to receive Christ's life, which is eternal life. All right, so don't believe all them lies you hear that somebody can baptize you in water in Jesus' name and give you eternal life. Don't, don't, don't fall for them lies. Don't fall for nobody can wash your feet in water and sanctify you. Don't, don't, don't fall for, you can eat bread and wine on the table and, and the body of Christ can come inside of you. I don't think people realize what people believe when they eat the bread and the wine on the table. They say that's how Christ come inside of you. Some people believe that that's when God forgive you your sins. Or that's what, see, all kind of stuff. Jesus died on the cross. God prepared himself a lamb. He sacrificed his lamb and he's calling you to come to supper. Come and eat, come and dine. Receive God's sacrifice. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, well, I'm going to start reading verse 42. Now, he's comparing Jesus with Christ. Remember, Jesus is the natural man, son of Adam. Christ is the spiritual man, son of God. Everybody got that? All right. Verse 42, so also the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption, is raised in incorruption. It's sown, planted, buried. At this outside man here, Jesus, was sown, planted. And when you saw him 2,000 years ago, he was in corruption. But once he was raised from the dead... He was in incorruption. Corruption, incorruption. Two different men. Next verse. Verse 43. He was sown in dishonor. He was raised in glory. So you got to understand, this man you saw on the outside was sown, was sown. He didn't want to have to die the physical brute of death. Jesus because he had the soul. He was the soul man. Jesus was the soul man. Christ in Jesus was the spirit man. Now I'm going to give you a verse. I'm going to take you over to Isaiah chapter 53, and I'm going to show it to you in just a moment. You can already find it. He was made an offering for our sin. His soul, as a matter of fact, I might as well just take you over there now. We'll come right back to 1 Corinthians 15 and 43. Let's go to Isaiah 53 right quick. And we want to look at one verse and verse number 9. As a matter of fact, we'll go to verse 8. Isaiah 53 and verse number 8. Let's read that down because this is what I want to show you. He was taken from prison and from judgment, who shall declare his generation. He was cut off out of the land of the living, for the transgression of my people was he stricken. He made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence. 
neither was in the seat in his mouth. Watch the next verse. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief when thou shalt make his soul. There it is. This man on the outside, Jesus, was born of a virgin Mary so he could have a soul. God birthed him through Mary so he could be born in the flesh so he could have a soul. Remember, that man had a soul. But then there was a man on the inside of him who's Christ, who was spirit, all spirit. So now you would have spirit, soul, and Jesus on the outside body. Follow me along. Now, in verse number 10, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him the grief. When thou shalt make his soul, watch this, an offering for sin. So you got to understand, the sin offering was the soul of Jesus. Why? Because he came as son of man, son of Adam. He had to be born in the flesh so he would have a soul because the soul that sinneth, Adam sinned, Adam was soul, soul sinned. So Jesus had to die. He had to be born, first of all, so he could have a soul, so he could die as the Son of Man. All right, here we go. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offer for sin, he shall see his seed, Christ, seed. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Verse 11, he shall see the travail of his soul. So why was Jesus beaten? Why was he whipped? Why was he beaten all the way to the cross? Because of Adam's sin and transgression. He was paying the price for Adam's sin and transgression. He was the son of Adam. He came as the son of man so he could die, buried, and be raised again from the dead. So they whipped him. They beat him because God was looking at Adam paying for what he's done. He shall see the travail of his soul. That's why in the garden, his soul cried out. His soul cried out. And his soul wept, and his soul thirsted. His soul. All right. It says, He shall see the travail of his soul and be satisfied, and by his knowledge, there it is, by his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many. How did he justify you? By his knowledge. For he shall bear their iniquities. Now, in verse 12 said, Therefore would I divide to him a portion with the great. He shall divide the spoil with the strain, because he has poured out his soul. There it is again. He has poured out his soul unto death. So that's what he did. And he was numbered with the transgressors. He bare the sins of many and made intercession for the transgression. So once again, because he has poured out his soul. Now, you saw the blood of Christ running down his face and down his back and down his feet. But God saw that as his soul, his life. The life of the flesh was in the blood. Let me say it again. Let me show it to you. Leviticus 17, 11. Let's go back there. So you got to see why Jesus was, had to die and was buried, was beaten and whipped, because he had to pour out his soul to death. That word soul there means life. He had to pour out his life to death. Pour out. 
all of his blood in him had to be poured out around the altar. The Bible says he was marred more than any man. He was slain. He was crucified like you do a wild animal or a tame animal. Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11. Just one verse. For the life of the flesh is in the blood. So when Jesus Christ died on the cross or when Moses took the blood in a basin and sprinkled all the furniture, the life of the flesh was in the blood. So when Jesus' blood poured out of him, they pierced him in the side and out came blood and water. Why, why they had to make sure all the blood would come out? Simply because the life of the flesh is in the blood. Je Jeremiah 17, 11, once again, the life of the flesh is in the blood. And I have given it to you, watch this, up on the altar. So that's why Jesus had to die on the cross. That was his altar. I, was gi I have given it to you up on the altar. Why? To make an atonement for your souls. To make an atonement for your souls. God had to reconcile us back to God. He had to forgive us. He had to pay for our sin. But he had to do it all on the cross. Make reconciliation. Isn't that something? To make an atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that make an atonement for the soul. It is the blood that make an atonement for your souls. So we're going to go to Hebrew 9.22. We're going to pick it up. The same thing that he's talking about right there. They couldn't have done it without the blood of Christ. God could not have done this without his son's blood. Hebrew chapter 9. Jesus had to be willing to die on the cross so we would have a sacrifice. We had to have his blood to redeem us. Redemption was through the blood. Hebrew 9, 22 is where we're going to go to next. Hebrew chapter 9 and verse 22, look what it says. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood. So when you see people washing feet, listen, <laughs> you can't purge nobody with washing their feet. God purged us with his blood. We go to Hebrew 9, 14 after we do this one. Look at Hebrew chapter 9, what we own right now, verse 22, right? And almost all things are by the law purged with blood and without shedding of blood. If Christ had not shed his blood, there would be no remission of sin. The word remission means forgiveness. If Christ has not shed his blood on the cross, there would not be any remission of sin. He couldn't have died anywhere else. They couldn't have just let him die. No, he couldn't have been shot. He couldn't have been, he had to die on the cross because God had to have the blood on the altar. And the cross was his altar. And that's why the blood was poured out on the cross. Hebrew 9, 14, we write there. Hebrew 9, 14. How much more? Hebrew 9 and verse 14. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offer himself without spot to God. Nobody else could offer himself to God because they, nobody else were without sin. There was spot. Nobody else was without sin before God. Nobody but Jesus. So the Bible said, how much more? Shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offer himself without spot to God, purge your conscience. How did, how did God purge you and cleanse your soul, your conscience? This is when he did it 
Christ's death on the cross was my death. Christ's soul on the cross was my soul. The soul of man. See, when God looked at the old covenant, he looked at one man. One man's obedience, one man's disobedience. So what you saw on the cross was one man obedient, but one man obedient was for all of our, for all of us, because you can't obey God to be saved; you can only receive God's salvation. But watch what it says again: He purged our conscience, our soul. The other words for conscience is soul. He purged our conscience from dead works, so we can serve the living God. How did He do it? He did it with his own blood on the cross. See, when God saw Christ's blood poured all over Jesus, that's why Jesus had to be beaten until the skin would be beaten off of his body. He had to be marred more than any man. See, you got to understand Jesus was called the Lamb of God. And one thing you have to understand when you take a lamb, you have to take the skin off the lamb. And when, how do they get the skin off this lamb? They beat him. They beat it off of him. And that's why his skin was peeling up all over his body. They beat him from his head to his toes. Never did nothing wrong. But he was paying the price for the first man. Paying the price. So in 1 Corinthians, let's go back to, let's go back to 1 Corinthians 15 one more time in verse number uh, 43. That's where we're at. Hope you're enjoying the word. Jesus paid it all, man. But you got to understand, there were two deaths. There was a natural death with Jesus, and there was a spiritual death with Christ. He paid both deaths. All right. It's shown a natural death. I'm sorry, in verse 43, I'm sorry. It is shown in dishonor. That was Jesus. It's raised in glory. That's Christ. It is shown in weakness. That's Jesus. It's raised in power. That's Christ. So if you go look at the word Christ, Christ is the power of God. And then in verse 44, it's shown a natural body. That's Jesus. It is raised a spiritual body. So when God, when Jesus died, gave up the ghost, he died. The natural body, the natural man, Adam, and all of what Adam had done had been now paid for. And then God is going to bury that old man of sin, that old body of sin, and going to leave it in the tomb for three days and three nights. But that Sunday morning, early that Sunday morning, watch what he's going to say. It was shown a natural body. It was raised a spiritual body. It was not the natural body that came out of that tomb. That's what you got to understand. God is not doing this now. He did it 2,000 years ago. So when I teach you on baptism after a while, I'm going to show you baptism is not taking place now. Baptism took place two years ago. We are still trying to do what God already did because we don't know. He's not talking about your baptism. He's talking about his baptism. He's not talking about, see, like right here, he's not talking about your resurrection. He's talking about his resurrection. He's not talking about your corruption, he's talking about his corruption. He's not talking about your dishonor, he's talking about his dishonor. He's not talking about your glory, he's talking about his glory. And then it was sown in weakness and raised in power. Verse 44 is sown in not your body. He's not talking about you, he's talking about Jesus. He was sown in not your body, he was raised a spiritual body, Christ. He was raised a spiritual body, that's us. We are the body of Christ. There's a natural body, and there's a spiritual body. If you're in Christ, you are the spiritual body. Then in verse 45, and so it's written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. Remember, Christ 
Jesus, Jesus Christ, the first man, Jesus, the first man, Jesus, second man, Christ, first man, Adam, second man, the second Adam, which is Christ. If you can just see Jesus Christ, Jesus, the first man, that's why you hear so many people don't understand when they keep saying Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. They do not understand God made that same Jesus whom you crucified. He is not Lord in Christ. I'm going to show you that's Acts 2.36. I'll get a chance to show it to you. But here we go again. Acts, um, 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 45. And so it's written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a life-giving spirit. So when he was raised from the dead, he is a quickening spirit. I know they, I know they show you the TV, but hear what the Word says. When Jesus walked out of that tomb, he was a glorified heavenly body. Spirit. Spirit. In glory. Now, so the next verse 46 says, How be it, that was not first which is spiritual. See, that was not first, but that which is natural. Jesus. Jesus was first, and then Christ. Jesus was first, and then Christ. Howbeit that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterward that which is spiritual. Because if you don't have a natural, then you don't have no image and no likeness. See, what God gave you through Adam was your soul. What he gave you through Adam was his image and his likeness. So I have my image. I'm six feet three. Well, 230 pounds. This is my image. Now, I had to bear the image of Adam. Now, the only difference in me, in my glorified heavenly body, is I don't have the flesh and the blood. If you could see me, I would look like I look now, but I'm glorified. Without clothes, I wear glory now. I don't have on flesh and I don't have in blood. I'm all spirit. So you, I hope you can be able to see that. So verse number 46 again says, Howbeit that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and after that which is spiritual. Then he goes to say, The first man is of the earth. Earthly. Adam. Jesus. See, that's why he was called son of man, son of Adam. He represented Adam. When he was born, he said, I am the son of Adam, son of man. In his genealogy, he's the son of Adam. In his genealogy, he's the son of God. So you have to see son of man. That's why you had Matthew write about him as the king. Mark wrote about him with no genealogy, but he wrote about him as the slave, the servant. And then Luke going to write about him as the son of man. And then John going to write about him as the son of God. Got all those? I need to go over them again. Matthew will write about him as the king, the king of Israel. But when it came down to Mark, and Matthew had a genealogy, and Luke had a genealogy of who Christ is, who Jesus is, who Christ is. But not Mark. Mark wrote about him as a servant. So from, the, from chapter 1 on, he's just serving, 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 serving. Because that's who Mark wrote about him. Luke wrote about him as son of man. And then John wrote about him as son of God. 
So when you begin to look at the word of God, you have to know what that means. Jesus fulfilled that in his ministry. Now, let's go to verse 47. 1 Corinthians 15, 47. The first man is of the earth, earthly. That was Jesus. The second man is the Lord from heaven. Now, what is he telling you? This first man that you saw that was born in Bethlehem of Judea, Nazareth, that was the first man. See, he's taken Adam's place as son of Adam. But when he rises from the dead, he's not flesh and blood no more. He's not man. He poured out his blood at the cross. Watch what it says. The first man was on the earth earthly. The second man, watch this, is the Lord. So when he rose from the dead, he's now who he is and was and is to come before he came to the cross. Before he came in the earth. See, he, he was born in flesh to become Jesus. Now, once he rise from the dead, he is Lord. He is God now. Lord God. So you got to see the difference. In verse number 48, and as is the earthly, such are they also that are earthly. As is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. As we have born or worn or put on the image of the earthly, we shall also be bare or wear the image of the heavenly. All right, let's look at it. Jesus came in the image and likeness of his father Adam. That was him, with his beard, with his hair, with his dress, with his sandals, just like his father Adam. He was the son of Adam, son of man. He ate, he drank, he sweat, he bled, he died, but then he rose again from the dead. Now once he rose from the dead, we moved into the second image. We had, he had to bear the image of the heavenly. Now, the image of the heavenly is Christ. Now, let's look at Acts 2.36. I know I'm spending a lot of time here, but I really want you to see this. Look at Acts chapter 2 and verse number 36. See, this is what happened to Jesus. Most people can't preach Christ because they don't know Christ. Acts chapter 2 and verse 36. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God had made that same Jesus. He's talking about here. So you're still talking about Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Listen, God made that same Jesus, this man, son of man. He made this same man that died on the cross. He made him. He crucified him, buried him, raised him from the dead. Once he raised from the dead, he is now both Lord and Christ. See, we still want to see a man. We still want to see a man and instead of beholding. You know, angels, I believe, in, always bows in the presence of God. That's how holy God is. But the Bible told you God is spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. We still want to deal with natural things. And we don't understand God is not natural. God is spirit. And he's now called Lord and Christ. Hallelujah. All right, now, let's go to something that I want to deal with in this scripture. 
And I want to show you two things. I want to show you the term in Christ. Look at 1 Corinthians 15. That's, we got about 12 minutes. 1 Corinthians 15. I'm going to show you what it means to be in Christ. Because the, the greatest thing that I found out, Mrs. Crump, that religious people think they are the ones and their ministries and their denominations who put you in Christ. So let's look at that. Let's see how do we get in Christ. I, I know that I'm not giving you all what I want to give you, but let's, let's give you what he want to give you, right? All right, let's look at this. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, let's go back to verse number 20, uh, 20 and we're going to read that down to verse 22. Three verses, 20 through 22. Watch what it says. But now is Christ risen from the dead. Watch what it says. Now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man, talk about over here, Adam, as the son of man. That's why Jesus died, because his father, Adam, disobeyed God, ate of the tree of neither good and evil, and took us from law to sin to death to hell. But Christ raised us from the dead and gave us eternal life. So watch what he's going to say here. But Christ is not, but Christ has risen from the dead and become the first fruit of them that slept. For since by man, by Adam, came death. Also by man, this last man, Christ, also the resurrection of the dead. So watch what happened. One man died on the cross to pay for all the sin and the debt that the old man Adam did and then take you into a new life in Christ. Watch what it says in verse number 22. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Now, every man that would receive what the Father did on the cross in sacrificing his son, his death, his burial, and resurrection for our sins would now enter into the new life. Because the new life now is Christ. Let me say it again. The new life is Christ. To, watch what it says, 1 Corinthians 15, 22. As in Adam all die, in Christ shall all be made alive. So when did God make you alive? When he puts you in Christ. Now, I'm, I want to go somewhere because I want to show you what religious teaches you. Religious teaches you that they baptized you in water and put you in Christ. And that's what people are believing the day God saved their soul from hell. Your faith is in your water baptism. All right, let's show it to you. I just gave you 1 Corinthians 15. Let's go to show it to you now in 1 Corinthians 12. I'm going to give you, let me, yeah, give me, while I'm there, go back up to 1 Corinthians 12. Then from here, I'm going to go to Galatians 3, 27. 1 Corinthians 12. Let's go look at it. 1 Corinthians 12. I got about eight minutes. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And verse number 12 and 13, just two verses. For as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. All right, now let's, let's, let's remember, we're talking about one body. We're not talking about your denomination. We're not talking about your church. We're talking about one body. Somebody, somebody put that out there. We're talking about what? One body. Christ is what? One body. So people are telling you water baptism puts you in Christ. There's only one body. 
Let's find out how we got in Christ, shall we? We read you 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 12. Now we look at verse 13. Let the Spirit tell us, for by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body. Remember, there's only one body, and that's Christ. So there's one body. See, so otherwise, if you didn't baptize me in water in Jesus' name, what you are saying to me is, I'm not in the body. Because I can only get in the body when a person from an apostolic church or a Catholic church or all the people believe in water baptism put me in Christ. That's what you are saying. And you are saying all the people that's in Christ, you, put them, you help put them there. Look what it says, verse 13. For by one spirit, I'm giving you the knowledge of God's word. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. Now I want you to see this. It does not tell you what's going to happen. It tells you what God did. What is grace? Grace is what God did for you. So God, Holy Spirit, is telling you that he put you in Christ. When did he put you in Christ? Here. Here, right here. All men were put in Christ at the cross. He died for our sins. We were buried with him. I'm going to show it to you. And then he put us in Christ. And then he raised Christ from the dead. Let's go back, and let's go back to Adam. Let's go back to the first Adam. When were you and me in Adam? When were we in Adam? When God created Adam. Let me say it again. God put us in Adam when he created Adam. Wife, when did God put Renee in me? When he created me. See, when God created the man, he put his seed in the man. All men were put in Adam. So when Adam sinned, we all have now sinned and come short of the glory of God. So at the cross, God made, watch this, a new man. Colossians chapter 1, verse 15. Colossians chapter 2, I'm sorry, verse 15. Told you that God made a new man. That new man is Christ. Ephesians 4, 24. That new man is Christ. He made a new man. Created him in righteousness and true holiness. Ephesians 4, 24. He created a new man. Now when he did, he put me in the new man. I wasn't born yet. I wasn't born again yet. Because the way you will know who's in Christ is you have to preach Christ crucified and the Holy Spirit will reveal to you who in Christ. None of us know. We didn't know Paul was in there. We did not know Paul was in Christ. But when Paul got the revelation, he realized, I am what I am by the grace of God. When God created Christ, he created us in Christ. The Bible told us we were created in Christ Jesus. Let me show it to you, Ephesians chapter number 1. Or chapter 2 and verse 10. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10. We are his workmanship. We are his workmanship. See, we used to be Adam workmanship. Adam created us physically and naturally. But now we are his workmanship. 
Watch this. We were created. That word workmanship means new creation. We were created in Christ Jesus. We were created in Christ Jesus unto good work. We can't do nothing but good works because we created in Christ Jesus. So that's how you know you're in Christ. And the Bible says, which God has before ordained that we should walk in him. Look at, look at another quickly. Romans chapter number, no, Galatians 3, 27. Galatians chapter 3, verse 27. What an awesome God we serve. Galatians chapter 3 and verse number 27. Just one verse. For as many of you, watch what it says. It don't tell you going to be. As many of you have been, have been baptized in the Christ. As many of you have been, remember it happened here at the cross. As many of you have been baptized, Put in the Christ, have been baptized in the Christ, have put on Christ. Nowhere in that Bible is going to tell you this is going to happen. Salvation is not taking place today. It took place 2,000 years on the cross. You just got to find out what it means. Look at Romans chapter 6. Go back. Romans chapter 6 and verse 3. Romans chapter 6 and verse number 3. Know ye not that so many of us were, so many of us were baptized into Jesus Christ, were? See, all of this happened back here at the cross. See, when you don't preach the cross, you won't know this. As many of us were baptized into Christ, were baptized into his death. That's already happened. And verse number four, therefore we are buried, there it is, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also shall walk in newness of life. For we have been planted together in the like have been past tense, planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing that the old man is crucified with him that the body of sin might be destroyed, that we should henceforth not serve sin. Man, look, my time is already gone. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 1, and let me show you something. Ephesians chapter number 1 and verse 13. So that's why Paul says, Galatians 2.20, he says, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. All of this stuff you're talking about, baptism, it took place at the cross. The Holy Ghost put you in Christ. That's why 2 Corinthians 5, 17 said, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. That's why if I preach Christ and him crucified, People will give their life, not to me, not to my ministry, but to Christ. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse number 13 and 14. In whom you also trusted, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after you believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance unto the redemption of the person's possession, unto the praise of his glory. God has given you his word. He has given you his son. He has died, buried, and raised again from the dead. He has now become both Lord and Christ, waiting for you to receive your redemption that he's paid for at the cross. My time is up, and I thank you for yours. And the door of faith is open unto you.